How many people are trying to avoid putting in a septic system for economic reasons? Just it, you know, on the properties, don't want to do that. Is, it, is there anybody who's just thinking of a just a alternative to an expensive digging operation? Okay, that's. And then other people may be interested in, I assume, the just the reduction of water use, and that's what most people here are interested in, and the potential for generating more compost, which, as Ned described, really isn't a big... The human factor, as far as volume of compost, is really, is really quite minuscule, but it is, um, it is a way to uh, safely avoid flushing massive amounts of water down the toilet. The reasons that we just discussed about why you might want to put in a leachate field uh, are legitimate, um, and one way to make that investment last you know, quite a long, long, long time without pumping is to invest in a, in a low flow or micro flush toilet. And there's two different levels of, um, of uh, water passage through the commode. A, a, a regular toilet flushes about, well, an old fashioned toilet, which includes many, many toilets still in use, will allow probably five gallons of water to go down with every flush. Some of them are worse than that. Some of the, some of the really old commercial units from, you'll see some old buildings in Asheville and maybe even here in Hendersonville that haven't been upgraded. I've seen the tanks are humongous. They, they may let go six or seven gallons with every flush. Contemporary toilets that are not expensive uh, or even modern toilets that maybe aren't that new may only, do, may only allow uh, three and a half gallons or four gallons to go, which isn't bad. But I'm talking about 1.6 1. 1. gallons of water. If you go to Lowe's or Home Depot, uh, many of the options there are, and, and also at, at a very reasonable price and attractive looking units, uh, many of the options there are 1.6 gallon flushes. And then you can go to the plumbing supply house uh, or look online and do a little research and order uh, from, even from some of the big box stores, you, you can order from a, one of the major manufacturers the micro flush toilets. And they, we're not here really talking about flush toilets, but they, uh, some of them operate with a dual handle, so you have a one, one level down is, is just water and the other full level is solids. Some of them have uh, very sophisticated traps that are engineered to allow a huge suction even with a very small amount of water. It's really not that difficult to get a low, a low flush toilet for, uh, we installed two, three of them up here at the, one of the residences up here. Uh, we had a workshop on home efficiency and um, they were not anywhere near the three and four hundred dollar range. I mean they were down in the, I believe for the one we only paid a hundred and twenty nine dollars maybe for the one at Lowe's. Uh, very attractive. And they're all uh, ADA height, you know, there's a, it's a 19 and a half inch uh, higher stool. Um, and there's some other features, uh, elongated seats and things you just want to look for to sort of upgrade. If you have a, an existing leaf field or you are thinking about having to install one for the reasons that Ned discussed, you can, you can avoid the maintenance costs uh, by the maintenance cost being like having it pumped every three years or whatever. You know, in a, in a larger family it could be quite frequently and, and smaller families and people who are a little more conscious of their um, water use, uh, you know, you can stretch that out, but if you stretch it out too long and you, and you don't maintain it and just ignore it, it will build up solids and then you will have to get it pumped. And uh, if the solids float in the septic tank or rise in the septic tank just through buildup and then cross, there's, a, there's an actual separator wall, cross that wall and they then move, they migrate into the leach field. And once that happens, then your leach field has to be dug up. Now, in most cases, I mean, there are some there are some technologies that allow you to sort of clean that out, but it doesn't really it doesn't really address the. Uh, it's like a pipe cleaner. It doesn't really address everything. It's, there's still residual material in there. So that what that does is clog up the little uh, perforated holes that allow the the black water to separate and uh, and migrate out into the soil, which where, which is where all the micro uh, bacteria reside, uh, if those holes are plugged with solid material from the septic tank, then that water will not flow out, things get overloaded, and that's when you have to have the toilet pumped. If you, if you uh, have, have put in so much solids into the, into the uh, leach field, which is really just a series of, um, 
depending on the size, it it just looks like this. I mean, you've got um, you know, I generally just have a fork design. The septic tank is here. I'm not, I can't draw the whole thing, but then you'll have maybe 60 feet of run, and that water will mi and there's a distance between here. That water, that black water, will migrate out from here, and the soil will take care of it. Um, they'll have to go back and re and dig all this up again, possibly re configure a whole new system at a, d a different location. So it does get expensive in, in the in the matter of you know eight thousand dollars or, or so. Um, it could get up to that much. So it's it's um, that's just one method of of not overloading your septic tank is to just think about the toilet. Um, I did want to address the legalities a little bit. Um, this gentleman here pointed out that uh, in North Carolina there isn't really a legal way to use the system. I mean, in April of 2015, and on this sheet I gave you, um, you see the North Carolina Division of, of Public Health, which is part of the, you know, the health department, they actually compiled a guidelines for basically for health officials and other people working in that field as to what, what was and was not allowable. And essentially, I mean, we, we cannot advocate that you do any of this. I mean, it's just, it's just a matter of if you if you have a indoor composting system, it has to be NSF. NSF is the national. Uh, it's a it's a uh, uh, sewage and safety foundation for water purity. Um, it has to be approved. It has to be um, uh, you know the stamp, the stamp of approval. You have to have an existing uh, conventional system. Um, the people may ask why the why outhouses are still around. Well, they are. They're just they've just been grandfathered in, and as those as those um, properties are sold or as those uh, as those systems fail, they are replaced with conventional septic systems. There has there are there has been funds. I don't know if there are at this point now, but there was a there was a move a movement to use state funds and uh, some federal funds to help replace some of those. Some of those uh, just basic outhouse systems, which is not a composting toilet, but replace them with uh, with modern systems. So essentially, um, to answer your question, is really uh, you you can you'll read that if you if you see it. It's a two. It's a actually a two or three page uh, letter with what is and is not allowable. Um, there's a lot of information in there. Uh, legally, it is it is very difficult to build your own composting toilet and use it without breaking the law. We cannot advocate that you do that, but I can tell you that many, many people in many, many states are doing just that. In, in places that are a lot more um, strict about things that have more inspections than, than we do. I mean, on the West Coast where things are extremely more um, regulated, um, people do it all the time. Now, that, I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, if, if you had a specific question about that, um, I, I, you know, I'm not really sure what. Yeah. Uh, well, there are issues that come up. In my case, one of the reasons for composting is because of proximity to some streams with some cats. Right. Okay. That's a big deal. Uh, uh, just to uh, fine tune that ridiculous point about North Carolina and their their capacity. I've spent God knows how many hours on the phone. Yeah. Talking to everybody under the sun about this at the state level. Uh, they have a couple of units of their own that are experimental that are operating in look centers. Right. And for some reason, if I design the system, they won't even sit down and discuss it with me. Right. But they apparently have some of their own engineering staff who is involved in doing this at an experimental level. I'm kind of new. Yeah. Well, I will tell you, that's, um, uh, in 2006, I did inquire, I was thinking of my own, uh, I was built, going to build on a piece of property I had, um, and I was told there was, there were 100 permits that had been made available for experimental composting systems, Not, and many of them were um, already spoken for, but uh, there were some available, so I, they may have been used up. I don't know if they re, I don't know if they re, visit this and recycle some of those or whatever, but I would, I would ask about the experimental permit, if, if, if you're still pursuing this, ask about the experimental permit, see if there's any slots available for that. They may have, they may have canceled that, that program altogether, or like you said, they may have only 
kept it for uh, experiments in what they would call legitimate areas like parks, state forests, places that are remote, and that's that's addressed in the in the in the little mem memo that I referenced in those papers. Um, in places where the it is impractical to pump water out of flush toilet, whatever they are allowed. That's you know, but those places are also state owned and operated, and so that's you know that's that. Um, the um, you know as Ned said the the safety and the pathogen issue is foremost above all it has to be done um, but on the other hand you know what the option is and I, I, this, I experienced this myself I had a, a septic system failure many many years ago uh, in this county and um, the backhoe we couldn't dig up the septic the septic tank we couldn't expose the septic tank to check the issue to check the problem because the backhoe was unavailable it had been it had been taken far away and it wouldn't be available for about four or five six days the guy who was uh, excavating the stuff and and checking the system basically the licensed guy said we'll just straight for that week we'll just straight pipe it into the creek well I mean you know that's what's going to happen if if there, if people are denied the um, ability to <coughs> do something safely you know they're going to just do what they have to do, and that's that's far far worse. It's like it's like it's like not accepting things at the landfill. Um, you know oh, we don't take that, we don't take that. Where that, that's just going to end up for most for many many people, that's just going to end up on a country road at midnight, right off the side of the road. That's where it's going to go, and that's not solving the problem. You know uh, I don't know what is solving the problem. Maybe charging a fee for taking in television sets or big couches or whatever it is you find in gullies, but. You know, the answer is, is to, the answer is not to say um, we we just don't take it. So find your own solution. Well, that's the solution. So that's that's what I know about the, the regulations. Is 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 you may want to read those that memo, and you may find something in there that may may be to your advantage. But um, you know, I can't really you know I can't really say that. Um, one of the, the other things I wanted to address was um, the lofting issue. The um, we were talking about uh, what what else besides compressed pine pellet stoves. Now, now many pellet stoves, or ideally pellet stoves, use a hardwood, not a pine. But you can get cheap pellets, and, and they're sold in much more bulk, much more uh, uh, volume, or bigger, you know, bigger containers than the little bag of kitty litter. The little bag of kitty litter is is called the brand name is called feline pine, and it is, that's all it is. It's just a there's a a binder, it's not an organic binder, but it's a, it's a um, fairly innocuous glue, basically, that holds, not even, it's just a binder, I don't even know if it's a glue, but they pressure, they um, pressurize it so much that it sticks together, but there is another substance in there, but it is not an adhesive that's chemical. Uh, the Feline Pine is the one name brand, and then Engel sells its own, its own brand, which I forget. Yeah? With all the sawmills that we have in right. North Carolina, Going and getting a pickup truck load of sawdust mm -hmm. for ten dollars, right? To filling up a tote, a two hundred seventy-five gallon tote with sawdust for ten dollars, it'll last two people and it'll six months to a year. Yeah, is a rather cheap way of going about it. Right, you know, somebody with a pickup truck and some storage at the house. That's the way I would do it. Now I'm going to show you something here. The long leaf. I mean, the lo th these are planar shavings. I don't know, you know, I'll, I'll pass it around if you can. It's not, it's clean. Uh, <laughs> uh, this long, lofty, um, lightweight, I mean, this is too dry, but I, you know, it's just the way, I, how I store it. But you can, you can brush it off your clothes, we'll sweep, we'll sweep up. <laughs> And if <laughs> maybe you want to pass the bucket around. Yeah, maybe that's better. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about your pants. Um, anyway, that's a that is a a woodworking a mill workshop or woodworking shop or just an individual who uh, that you might know or yourself who who does home woodworking has a planer. You know, these are this is really good because it's a long, thin, airy sawdust. When it gets when it gets too fine, is is it's, it's okay, but it's not great. This stuff is like, there's a lot of air in here, and that's exactly what you want, aerobic digestion. The other stuff that works, um, 
Quar. Quar coconut hulls are, are ground up into a hairy, they use, you'll see it in potted plants and from hanging plants, they usually line the, line the hanging plants, but that's because it's really, it has air in it, holds air and holds moisture for a long time. So it's a, it's a sort of a soft, um, very lofty or bulky, when I say bulk, I don't mean like weight, but I mean like it takes up a lot of space. So that's another good thing. Quar is not that expensive. What, what, what you want to try to do, like this fellow says, is to find a source. I mean, I get sawdust for free because the guy um, has a, a small bin he puts it in, but it, he's, he does so much volume of woodworking that he can't, he can't get rid of it quick enough. He has to pay to have it hauled. So that stuff is a little finer than I'd like, but you can, you can use that. Um, coconut coir, sawdust, these kind of shavings, the, the pine, and one thing I will say about the pine litter, I'm going to call it litter, uh, you know, it's, uh, it could be um, pellet, pelletized fuel <coughs> litter, uh, any other reason it, for that kind of stuff. I mean, it look, they look like uh, rabbit pellets, you know, uh, feed. Mm -hmm. But um, you can actually loft that stuff up by taking, instead of using it dry and just scooping in a half a cup of, with every, every deposit, you can actually take a bucket like this and fill maybe about that much with that, with that uh, pine pellet and then add water and actually stir it up. You know, use, you know, use a, a cat litter uh, spoon or, or, or reach in there. I mean, it's not dirty, just, just stir it up or, or whatever, however you like to do it. And let, that, let it break apart. Let it break apart on its own, which will happen very quickly. Um, when I use it as, litter, as a kitty litter box, you know, if I put it out, say, say Sunday night, I clean the box and I put it in there. Well, by Monday afternoon, you can see it's, it's he's he's gone in there, and um, where he's peed, it's like it's like it just turns from a hard pellet into a fluffy mound of, of just disintegrated stuff. And now that some of that may have occurred because he's digging in it, or maybe it just it just sort of fell apart and made a you know, made a little pile. But if you put the, a little bit of water in there and mix it up, it will disintegrate, and you can gauge. You know, you don't want sloppy wet, but you don't. You want it wet enough that it will break down. And you can just a little bit, maybe forty percent or half the bucket, if you've done it right, will fill it right up with with material, with the right texture, the right moisture, um, and a full bucket. So you can keep that by your by your composting toilet and take the scoop or your hand, or whatever, and and do it that way. And that actually, you've already made sawdust out of it, the right kind of sawdust out of it. So the, the only thing you're trying to avoid is really, really fine sawdust because that's so clumpy that um, you want like a, a, a coarser kind of sawdust, which, you know, you don't, a sawmill probably is, a, is a, better, a better source of that as opposed to, say, a, a mill workshop where the, where the blades are very fine, where they have 40 teeth on the blade and it cuts the sawdust into a really small piece of sawmill has a gnarly old bandsaw tooth or on the older guy's saw is a big circular saw and that'll make a chunky dust and that's, you know, that's good. Oak and hardwoods are not going to break down as easily. They will, but they won't break down as easily. Um, and the one thing that's really, really important is, is to not use treated sawdust from treated lumber. If you're going to source, you know, you may have, I don't know, maybe a business guy that builds decks or or docks or um, outdoor structures or something like that and so his sawdust will be a lot of treated lumber. Treated wood has, first of all, it has this, just from the very sense of why it's been treated, it's been treated so it doesn't rot and decompose. Well, you know, that's not what you want to put in your composting toilet because you do want it to rot and decompose. So um, the other issue is that especially older treated wood, uh, it, Long ago, they used a penta, which is like a carcinogen. They don't, they don't do that anymore. Um, then, there, then there was a, yeah. They also use cyanide. Yeah, cyanide, that's right. Uh, um, there's a, um, a um, ammonia and uh, salt. It's so much easier just to avoid, totally avoid treated lumber. The CCA, the carp, copper cyanide, or, or not cyanide, the copper arsen, or not, they don't even put arsenic in it anymore, right? Mm -hmm. They used to. Copper chromate, yeah. That's not good either. So every step of the, every every step of the way, as far as re <coughs> designing the way they treated wood, has been an improvement. But it's still not something we want to pursue. Uh, yeah. You also don't want to have walnut. Mm -hmm. Walnut hulls. 
I don't want walnut. Oh, you don't want one. No, no, you don't want walnut or you don't want, um, you do not want a cedar. You do not want any kind of wood that, uh, first of all, cedar isn't good for you. I mean, when you cut cedar wood, I mean, it's really uh, fairly toxic to the respiratory system. So that's why people, when they, when they work with redwood and cedar, that kind of stuff, it's, they always have a respirator. So, um, you know, pine is, is, is excellent. That's, and that's so common. So that's, you know, that's a good choice. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is actually two things. When you first start up a system, you'll want to inoculate it. You know, you, you, um, it's almost like uh, making beer or something like, like that. You know, you want to, get, you want to give the, activ the microbial activity a chance to, you know, get a good start. So you can purchase uh, from, from the regular composting companies, Envirolet, um, uh, I don't even know if Clivus Multrum is still around. That was an old. That was a one of the original toilet manufacturers. I'm not sure if they're still in business. Uh, Envirolet, Clivus Multrum, uh, Sunmar. Um, there's there's several other ones. That the the basic indoor commercial systems that are that are basically built into your structure, and they usually uh, several of them have actually a bin that goes from the living level where the toilet is down to a basement or some structure that has been added below that so that. Uh, it collects and composts right in the house or in the basement and, uh, and, and there's access from the outside so you can open the doors from the outside and, and all you have left is a good composted product. Um, those kind of companies sell an inoculant that they, they give you to start when you first build a system that starts the process going. You can get it from them, it's just a little bag of that, or you can go to um, a Garden Supply and, and they do have inoculants um, I don't know any name brands, but they do have actually an inoculant that's you know intended for gardening use. But um, you can get a supply of that and just put that in, which you know will help with the initial process, just to get things going. Um, you know, you have your straw or your uh, that was the other thing. Straw we mentioned. I think Ned mentioned that quite uh, you know quite several times. Um, so you have your straw, your sawdust, your quar, your uh, whatever else you might use as fluff. We used to use peat moss. There is absolutely no reason to destroy a bog to harvest peat, which is actually beneficial to the soil and to the, you know, to the natural environment. No point in, in ruining that and, and taking that resource when you have all this other stuff available that begs to be used up. So uh, if anybody says peat moss, which at one time you know, was a viable, or at least people thought it was a viable solution, well, you don't need to do that. Um, the sphagnum is, is not what we're going to do. It has bulk, it has all the right stuff, and it works good, but it's not, there's no point in doing it. Um, the uh, other thing is, um, in the composting process, in the actual pile, if we're, if we're building a, a conveyance system where you have a batch in the bucket or a batch in the, in the unit like we have, and then we're going to transfer that to a dedicated location where we're, gonna, we're going to, out, outside in the open, we're going to um, allow it to compost and break down for a good full year, um, you can actually add, just treat it like a compost pile. You can add, you know, your, your kitchen scraps, you can add the uh, grass clippings, you can add leaves, you can add, um, you know, anything you can add to a normal compost pile to get the correct uh, nitrogen and carbon ratio. Um, but you can also go to uh, a garden supply, Lowe's, Home Depot, whatever, and get yourself a big three, was it, three cubic yards or, or three cubic feet of, um, it's usually a, a, a composted or manure and soil, it's actually like a, pot, like a potting soil. And you can put some of that in. I mean, you can even use that in the toilet itself just a, a, little, a little bit, you know, as a, it's a, you don't want to put too much in. It's, it is fluffy, but it, would, it will build up bulk faster than, it's already been, you know, digested, but it's, it's still good fluff, but you don't want to use too much of that. But in the outside pile, you can just throw that in with the mix, and uh, it 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 also has a has a microbial action going on. So, you know, and that's not that expensive. I don't know what they you know you see it at Lowe's or whatever. They don't. It's, it's not costed for that much. This gentleman here, the man who wrote this book, Joe Jenkins, lives in Pennsylvania. He's actually a roofer by trade. He's a he's a um, slate roofer. I think he probably does any kind of high end architectural roofs. He does a lot of slate repair, a lot of slate installations. I believe he tile to whatever, but he's a roofer. He's, but he wrote what is now recognized, and he wrote it, I think this book is 2005 or 6, I think. Um, that's the third edition. He was, I think, the first one, either the late 70s or, or the mid, 
maybe the mid 80s and then the mid 90s, but excellent resource. You can, you can find these. This is one of the most popular company that published this, Chelsea Green. Um, excellent resource. He does stray from the conversation we've been having as far as how he treats the composted human material once it's treated, but uh, once it's uh, you know been gone through its through its uh, year. But there, he has excellent design for um, for a uh, privy composting system. He's got some really good insight into composting in general. He's got a really good historical analysis of how we got from you know from uh, soiling the water on the side of the road to where we are today, and um, there's a lot of, um, you know, some designs in here for, uh, well, you probably can't see it, but, but the, there's a design in here for a, a composting um, structure, so how he deals with his material once he's, you know, once he's taken it out of the, out of the uh, uh, toilet itself, the chamber. Um, anyway, I would highly recommend that, it's not, I think you could probably buy something like this for even four or five dollars used on Amazon, if, if you you know wanted to, then that's the Bible. Now, since then, 2016 actually, or fifth, well, I think he's writing in 15. We, Dan Shiras, is the the proprietor of the Evergreen Institute in um, in uh, Missouri. Um, he lived in Colorado before. He was a he's a he's a um, basically an environmental biologist. Um, taught at the. <coughs> University level as a as a, a doctorate degree in, in uh, I'm not sure what what specific but it's basically you know biology and background with environmental science uh, is his is his uh, area um, he has written many 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 books but this one is actually very readable not as dense um, Joe Jenkins gets into a lot of a lot of anecdotal things and just goes off in different tangents which are all interesting and all that but. If you if you wanted to just do a quick read, and it's very readable, this this would be a I would recommend getting both of them actually. But this is this is a really good book. This has a conversation about not just um, the uh, batch composting toilets, but also addresses a little bit about various types of home-based commercial toilets. Plus, he gets into gray water. About about a third of the book is about gray water, so you might be interested in that. Um, you know, Dan uh, has has used various systems, but he also is a big proponent of the the batch system, where you actually, you know, have a, a, a small amount of fecal material and and stuff working in your toilet, and then on a regular basis you transfer it to a dedicated spot, which you know is as long as that dedicated spot is handled in a in a safe and sound manner, it's, that's, you know, that is fine. I, in here, he, I was going to, I was going to address, and I, I can just, I'm going to replicate the chart, just so I can show you what, we can talk a little bit about the time element. While he's preparing that, a couple of side notes as I listen to a lot of, maybe clarification as much as anything, um, on the sawdust and on uh, the enzyme starters. Uh, enzyme start as he said, you can buy them, it kick starts it off, and so forth, uh, and it's available. But if you're not in a hurry, which you're not with making human or compost, your body already has these bacteria in them. So as soon as you dump into the material, you've just inoculated it. It takes a while, I mean, there's other factors, it's not going to be as fast, fast is throwing this extra in, but that's been demonstrated over time. I mean, you, it's, you, don't, you don't need to buy that stuff. I just wanted that kind of clear. It does, if you really want to keep it moving fast and you're doing indoor commercial and there's a volume issue and so forth, it makes sense to have it. But if you're just doing a, a bucket system or long-term and all that, you've already got that bacteria in there. Um, and then also with the sawdust part, I've had really, really good luck with sawdust over the years with a few caveats. Um, and I think a lot of it, it, it everything you said, the, the types all matter, but with the pine and some of the, even with the oaks and the hardwood, the sawdust, it, it's a surface area thing. 
You can throw in a couple of cutoff two by fours into your compost pile. Well, I got 30 to one ratio, we made it out. Well, by the time that wood breaks, you know, it doesn't pan out. Sawdust gives you a lot more surface ratio and works really well. Uh, but one thing that, that I have, intermittently, not every time, because I've gotten it from a couple of different sources and uh, uh, to get it, keep the sawdust as clean and covered as you can because critters like to get into there. I have intermittent problems with little, the little fleas that, that I'm convinced rode in on the sawdust. So it was, whether it was because it was sitting in the yard or whatever it was. Uh, but if you have the oxygen, you've got airflow and all these other things, so it's going to be a minimal issue. And when you see the airflow we've got worked up there, they'll be blown out of the, the, the whole chamber right away. They won't tell what goes on. Uh, but the, but the sawdust was really did work. Oh, and yeah, there's a little bit it was working on. Um, and I think there's a difference here, and I don't know if we're actually arguing on it or you have a difference of opinion. But the, the pine pellets, Richard mentioned, my, making the sawdust, definitely does that. And if, if you're not peeing into the bucket and you don't have a moisture issue, that has a lot of merit to it. It does all that. Even just throwing it in will do it. But if you're doing the bucket and you're peeing and you're not diverting and all that, just, in my opinion, just throw the pellets in because it's not quite popcorn, but it doesn't take long. That stuff sucks. So you got something really tight, it'll suck up the moisture really quickly, and you're not going to have the same, because it, I've seen it with the sawdust. If it's already that fine and you're, you're peeing in, you get too much liquid or whatever, it's going to get soupier a lot faster than the pine pellets puffing up and coming out. So it's become kind of a practical thing for it. Both of them are going to work. It's going to end up in the same place. And they don't take long to break down at all. They're, you know, turn it to sawdust once they're wet. So. Are we charted? Yeah, uh, this fellow has a... I think, well, I just want to make a statement. I think another thing to also consider, especially if you're using uh, your compost uh, in your gardens and so forth, and you're looking to do organic and that kind of, is toilet paper. But, you know, you need to make sure that you're getting a organic toilet paper as opposed to one that has been made with chemicals because then you're putting chemicals into your fertilizer. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so you need to worry about, uh, you know, you need to think about organic, also bi uh, biodegradable. Right. It helps with the breaking down process as opposed to the toilet paper that would flush in a, a commercial type system and so forth where it doesn't break down that easy. Yeah, and, and the extra expense you might pay for a, a, um, a biodegradable paper is largely offset by the by the savings in uh, water, you know, water and loss of water and any maintenance on the system and, and any of that. So that's the other thing um, is that some people, I mean, even, even I knew people growing up, I mean, they just, for whatever reason, nothing to do with mechanics of a toilet, but they, they put their paper after use into a, into a small, dedicated, lidded container that was next to the toilet, and that's, that was totally dealt with Separately, I don't know. You know, I'm not sure that family who did that. <laughs> the particular family, was mom or the, one of the kids or what. But somebody took care of that. I, I'm not sure how they, how really they took care of it. Because if you're if you're just dumping it in the landfill, along with the rest of the garbage, that's not good either. That's that's worse. But by not putting um, paper down into the composter to begin with, then you don't have that issue. I mean, you're still using the paper, but you're not you're not adding it to the mix. You know. So that's another another thought. You, well, um, your your distinction for the organic gardening is, is spot on. You know, if you the chemicals in the paper and so forth, uh, if you if you go to purist, but from it, lots of experience, toilet paper is basically paper and carbon. So there's absolutely no reason you, that you can't leave it in there with it, and, or any reason is it's going to not break down in the compost pile at all. Uh, and if you're not doing a, a truly organic garden, you're certified, and you're composting it down for a year, and then, uh, you know, it, it, throw it, I mean, you don't want to go crazy, but that's a, con that's a carbon contribution to the compost pile itself to use the TP and just throw it in there. And the, the, in my experience with it, because I do use toilet paper, well, uh, the question was once around, do you know, buddy? Uh, <laughs> 
the, the biodegradable stuff, septic tanks, safe, whatever, you know, there's designations, they will almost melt away on you. I mean, they just completely fall apart. But in a human or composting regime, you you got to wait a year anyways. The toilet paper, just the conventional, regular stuff, you know, whether it's soft or hard or whatever, <coughs> a, a two weeks into it, you can barely tell it's even in there, in a pile. It just goes away. So I would be, unless you're really a purist about it, is what I'm saying, don't worry about that too much and just throw it in there. And that's part of the, the carbon contribution to it. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is the chart I was trying to uh, reference before. Temperature is so critical in this in this component because Ned mentioned the time and temperature and um, and some of the other factors, the carbon and, and whatnot. But um, you can see, I mean, these uh, this is a safety zone. So uh, this is rough because I you know didn't really draw it out, but but uh, you can see that at 160 degrees the bacteria will be broken down. This is, this is one day, that's 24 hours, the way this chart is written, that's one day. So you've, you've already, you're already into the safety zone at that temperature at, within a day, not, not completely, but I mean, by, by the, you know, you're up in here. Um, this is a week, this is a month, and this is a year, but you see, at 65 degrees, we don't have any safety. It doesn't, basically we're not looking at anything good until 120 degrees, roughly. Now these correspond with, you may have noticed that, well, he's, uh, Ned said 160, some, some people say 158, 158, 112, instead of 120. Nothing magic happens at these numbers. We're just using uh, centigrade figures to work out. So normally the list would be, you know, the center, like 20, 30, 40, and it goes up. This is just a rounded off figure. That, that is actually 158 degrees, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's not that perfect. Yeah? These are biogenerated temperatures, not ambient? Um, that's what I was going to talk a little bit about. I think what we may, I don't, like what we may do is, is take a break after I finish this. And then, but they, just please remind me about that again, because part of the conversation I want to have is also to talk about benefits or and advantages of having an inside system as opposed to an outdoor system and what the trade-offs might be with both of those things. Um, but you can see that the mesophilic bacteria are, take, are, are starting to work in this range here. The, the cold bacteria are, are, are not doing what they have to do, you know, even, it's just, not, it's just not destroying the pathogens that needed to be destroyed. When you get up into your thermophilic bacteria, they are doing all, all the, you know, the important work, and that's all occurring up here. Now, Obviously, your house isn't going to be 106 degrees. Um, we're talking about in the compost pile, uh, in, the, in, a, in a commercial system where you have a self-contained, fully composting bin in the house. Uh, first of all, the temperature in the basement and, and in the structure. It doesn't have to be a basement. That just happens to be where the most common application. Um, is going to be a lot better than in February, it's going to be, you know, 52 degrees in the basement or 55 degrees, whereas outside it's going to be, you know, minus 10 uh, in Minnesota. Um, the, um, the action I'm talking about at these temperatures is within the actual composting pile, whether it's in your house or whether it's outside. Uh, so, in order for you to achieve in a, in a shorter time frame all this, the environment has to be ambient in a comfortable level. You know, you, you can't expect this to happen if your composting coat is outside and it's 15 degrees. Um, not a whole lot's going to happen until it gets warmer. Now it will, it will freeze. It will, um, it will just stop. I mean, the action will just stop until the weather gets warmer. And you may find, like around here, where you'll get 40 degree days, 42 to 5 degree days in the winter, and then it'll go down to 20. But you know, say 20 for more than two or three days. So it'll, it'll start up again and then stop again, start up again and stop again. And then it'll start to crank up in the spring when our temperatures get, you know, get more ambient and warm outside. And unless, you, unless you take steps, which I can talk a little bit about, into, into artificially providing heat to your system, uh, whether it's in the house or not in the house, through solar means or some other ways. There's really no point in heating, not with a, 
electric heater anyway, heating anything. Some of the systems use light bulbs for that purpose. It's a little, a little, it's a hundred watt light bulb is not, you know, horribly consumptive, but, you know, in my mind, I mean, why even use, why even use that? You can use a solar, hot air solar collector to do it. There's other ways of doing it, so we can talk a little bit about that. But, um, you know, this is the, um, this is the critical part of the safety issue is, is that, that it, it's up here in the high temperatures that things are happening. Yeah. In regards to this as well, um, have you done any research on using like anaerobic, like EM1 or Bugashi? Do you know anything about that? In terms no, of what, all, all I've done really is, uh, personally, is to use anaerobic digestion in making biogas. So that's a, that's a, that's a use of manures of, you know, human or otherwise, but use of manures to, um, to um, generate a, a, a methane. And, and that's a, you know, those bacteria, that's a, um, that's an anaerobic process whether you don't want air to be in there. Right. And, but I, but you're saying there's... Well, this is, it's a Japanese thing and it's more fermentation. Okay. And, yeah. and it's essentially used in uh, a variety of different applications. Yeah. But Pat, Patrick will be, I suppose Patrick Battle, who's our, our director, farm director, he, um, will, he should be here today at some point. Maybe, just maybe hold that question, you can ask him, he may know that. But the, um, uh, just, we were talking about the Chinese, for example, use um, have a whole economy, a whole working economy built around, uh, and still do probably in the very rural areas, built around the collection of human waste at night. India, Pakistan, you know, a lot of places they're actually collecting the material, and and it's va it's valuable. It's a valuable source for. That's how villages actually, very remote villages, and probably a lot less so in 2016, but. Um, when I was doing this in the mid '80s, uh, it, they were still, you know, clawing their way up to, you know, to uh, a higher income status for most people. And and um, in a in a remote village, there'd be a communal gas generating station, and all that was supplied by manures that was collected at night. And it was just a big drum, and people did the, uh, cooking took their cooking gas for their meals off of that. And the, the gas that we generate in biogas is just is is, uh, is really methane. Natural gas is about anywhere from ninety percent to ninety four point six percent methane. The rest of it's other stuff. But uh, but when we say natural gas or propane, for that's almost that's ninety percent or more methane. So um, you know they're just making it instead of instead of uh, drilling a hole in the ground and pumping it out. So. Uh, but it's almost 4 o'clock. Let's see, we take maybe a 10-minute break. Maybe it'll probably be 15 by the time we finish with it. But, and then we, I guess we can go down to, to talk in detail about the, uh, about the compost. <laughs>